welcome uh, to this course on uh, polymers uh, where we are looking at uh, uses and properties and uh, concepts associated with polymeric systems as well as we are looking at sustainability aspects. Uh, in uh, this week we are focusing on uh, the viscoelasticity of uh, polymers and uh, we have already defined how dynamic testing is used to characterize uh, the response of uh, viscoelastic uh, materials. And, uh, Simple models are very useful uh, for us to compare any realistic uh, macromolecular system that we are characterizing. So that we can uh, characterize the response of a new material or a uh, engineering material that we have chosen for an application and then compare it with respect to what is the response of a model and they try to understand what are the basic mechanisms which are present in the material. So our focus uh, remains on uh, understanding viscoelasticity and uh, in this lecture, we will uh, first uh, spend some time looking at uh, linearity, uh, linear system response uh, while discussing the viscoelastic uh, response. And then the two model which are examples of linear models uh, which means that uh, they are applicable for only small deformations. And uh, so we will uh, look at the response of these two models uh, to a creep and stress relaxation which we already defined in the last lecture the 47th lecture on uh, viscoelastic characterization. So uh, one of the questions that you can ask is uh, when is viscoelasticity important? Uh, why uh, did I say that polymers and viscoelasticity is synonymous? And uh, the, the answer is that uh, if relaxation processes time is similar to time scale of interest, then viscoelasticity is important. And time scales of interest uh, can be milliseconds to few years, uh, that is how uh, many of the phenomena that are associated with uh, applications of polymers, uh, that is the time scale we are interested in. Sometimes molding operations uh, happen so fast that uh, milliseconds uh, are time scales of interest and sometimes the plastic uh, structural part may uh, have a service life of 10 years or 15 years. So that is the uh, time scale of interest. So therefore, uh, the relaxation processes in polymers occur over all of these time scales. So therefore, viscoelasticity is always important. And given that there are multiple relaxation uh, processes and each relaxation process has a relaxation time, we term uh, each of and every relaxation process as a mode. So we say there are several modes in the material and uh, each mode uh, can respond uh, to the given condition. So given that there are several mechanisms and several uh, modes in the polymer, depending on the time scale of interest, some modes will respond in a particular way, some other modes will respond in another way. So what do I mean by this? For example, uh, for water uh, all the relaxation modes are very fast. So therefore they only dissipate energy. For a perfect crystal all the relaxation modes are extremely long. So therefore they only store energy. But for a viscoelastic material we will have combinations of viscous or elastic storage depending on the time scale of interest. So for example, if there are some modes. Uh, which are uh, uh, very fast, then we will only get uh, viscous contributions from them in a macromolecule. So for example, if the side group uh, rotation is very fast, then we just uh, will get uh, pretty much uh, viscous uh, response from it. But uh, we can also have uh, temperatures, let us say in the glassy state where uh, many of the modes are frozen and so we may then get uh, more dominant elastic contributions also. And uh, in some cases uh, when we are uh, intermediate time scales, then uh, we may have both viscous and elastic contributions present. And generally we understand uh, these viscous and elastic contributions by uh, using uh, some uh, mechanical analogs. And uh, so for example, a dash pot is a mechanical analog while uh, spring is uh, another uh, mechanical analog. This is for elasticity and dash pot is for viscous behavior. And uh, generally a viscoelastic material will have combinations of uh, viscous and elastic responses. But each of the dash pot and spring comes up with some characteristic time scales associated with it. And therefore uh, the overall response of uh, viscoelastic material will depend on the characteristic constants of each of these. So let us look at a uh, white model which is one of the simpler models uh, of uh, viscoelasticity. So if we ignore the term uh, which is the derivative of strain, then basically we have uh, 
uh, stress proportional to strain. So, therefore, that is just an elastic response which is like a Hookean solid response. On the other hand, if we ignore the second term, then uh, this response is nothing but what is the response for uh, a Newtonian fluid where stress is proportional to strain rate. So, therefore, Voigt model is a combination of uh, viscous and elastic uh, contribution in a Hookean solid and a Newtonian fluid combination. And uh, the parameters of the model are uh, the modulus like uh, constant which is uh, defining the elastic contributions and then a viscosity like uh, parameter which defines the viscous contributions. And it is the ratio of these two uh, which is called uh, retardation time uh, which can tell us about how strong uh, the viscous or elastic response is. So, as an exercise what you could do is you could divide uh, the terms here by E. So, you can have E void and then this will get cancelled and you will get 1 over E void. And then you can try thinking about what happens when lambda r is 0 and what happens when lambda r is infinite. So, do you get uh, the terminal responses as we describe them, the terminal viscous response or terminal elastic response. So, let us look at uh, what happens to white model when a creep uh, experiment is done. So, in this case uh, since constant stress is applied, the stress value will essentially becomes sigma naught. And then uh, creep experiment by definition is measurement of strain. So, according to white model then we have an ordinary differential equation in terms of E. So, there is a first order uh, derivative and then uh, strain itself which is related to a constant. So, the first order ODE the solution is exponential function. Notice also that this is a linear ODE and we had talked about uh, response of uh, uh, linear uh, uh, viscoelastic or linear dielectric response that the governing equation will be a linear equation. So, this is void model for example, therefore, is an example of a linear viscoelastic model. And so, the solution uh, exponential is uh, for the strain is uh, just an exponential increase when time is 0 uh, basically strain is also 0 and when time is infinity then the strain becomes constant. So, this basically is uh, the strain variation according to Voigt model and the value of this constant strain is nothing but sigma by. So, if we were to uh, define the compliance which is the response function, then that also will be an exponential function and uh, the constant value reached is 1 over the parameter of the Voigt model and the rate at which this increase happens. So, for example, many of the exponential functions uh, you may think uh, what is the time required for reaching 63 percent of the maximum value and all of that. So, all of that depends on basically the rate constant or in this case the relaxation retardation time. And so, the retardation time determines whether this increase in strain is fast or slow. Remember for a Hookean elastic material this is the instantaneous increase and becoming constant. So, you can again try to rationalize the value of lambda r and whether you get terminal elastic response or terminal viscous response. So, just to highlight again uh, the aspect related to linearity. So, linear response because uh, these uh, set of uh, analysis that we do will be necessarily valid only for small amounts of stress being applied. So, that the equilibrium structure of the material is maintained and uh, due to this linearity creep compliance is only a function of time. In case of non-linear response the creep compliance will be a function of time as well as the load which is being applied. So, this is a non-linear response. And if at all we apply multiple stress inputs because it is a linear uh, system, uh, linear ordinary differential equation which defines it, we can actually do overall strain response by superposition of response of individual stress input. So, I, I can apply sigma 1 find E 1 as a function of time, then apply sigma 2 find E 2 as a function of time, 
and then I can apply sigma 1 plus sigma 2 and uh, I can just get E 1 plus E 2 which will be also a function of time and uh, therefore, uh, this is called the superposition or scaling of the responses. So, if I double let us say E 1 uh, sigma 1 is uh, uh, half of sigma 2. So, sigma 2 is double of sigma 1 then what will happen is E 2 will also be double everywhere. But mind you both of them are functions of time E 1 E 2 and E 1 plus E 2 everything is function of time. However, there is a superposition of response possible. Uh, I can also do an experiment where I can apply value of sigma 1 for certain amount of time and then apply sigma 2 and again I can do superposition. So, the till certain time the response will be completely based on sigma 1 and then later on I can add on the response due to sigma 2. So, this superposition of uh, uh, responses is possible because of the linearity of uh, response that we are looking at. So, the Maxwell model uh, is another example. Uh, this is useful more for fluid like system and we will see soon that how the response is dominant uh, with more viscous nature while void model had more dominant uh, elastic or solid like nature. This again uh, you can see that if by cancelling uh, this term or uh, cancelling this term uh, you can get uh, both viscous and elastic response. Uh, you can uh, do that exercise and see which response leads to viscous and which response is related to elastic response. And uh, the characteristic time here is called the relaxation time and this is an indication of uh, how fast the relaxation processes are in the material and uh, both eta and E again are uh, models of uh, Maxwell parameter which determine uh, either viscous or the elastic uh, contributions. If uh, lambda is 0 then we have a predominantly viscous response if lambda is infinity then we have predominantly elastic response. So, now let us look at what happens to uh, Maxwell model in case of a stress relaxation experiment. So, if we take Maxwell model and apply condition which is valid when a stress relaxation experiment is done, what we have is a strain is constant. Since strain is constant this E dot which is derivative of strain will go to 0 and therefore, uh, we have again an ordinary differential equation in sigma equal to 0 and uh, again solution of this is also going to be an exponential function, but it is going to be an exponential decay in this case and so the decay depends on whatever is the magnitude of lambda. And you can again uh, look at the magnitudes of lambda and uh, justify to yourself that if the lambda is very large then uh, decay will be much slower and if lambda is very high you will have faster decay and so this is uh, these curves are being drawn with increasing lambda. So, more and more elastic rise like response as lambda is increasing and uh, so in this case the response variable is the relaxation modulus which is stress as a function of uh, stress divided by strain and it is again an exponential function. So, characterization of viscoelasticity involves looking at such functions. And now the challenge of course, will be is when I do a real material and look at the response of that real material, how do I rationalize what its response is. So, for example, let us say I measure a relaxation modulus for an unknown or new material which uh, I, uh, I have decided for an application and uh, then I get uh, data points which uh, seem to indicate some variation. So, it seems to be uh, decaying. Now, the question is uh, whether uh, this is a Maxwell kind of a material is this. So, how, how do I start doing? So, what I can do is I can just start fitting an exponential and try to see if, uh, I, if I fit it. So, let us say if I try fitting and if I can fit only this part of the curve or I can fit this part of the curve then I clearly know that uh, one single exponential is not sufficient to explain the behavior of this real material. So, then I have to start thinking in terms of saying that oh maybe there is more elastic contribution, maybe there is more viscous contribution than what uh, Maxwell uh, model suggests. So, therefore, I need to modify my model. Other possibility is to say that look uh, instead of having one lambda in the material, maybe there are uh, several lambdas and again because of superposition, 
if there are uh, lambda i relaxation processes in the material, the overall relaxation modulus is nothing but summation of all of these individual relaxation processes. So, therefore, I can have a set of exponential functions which I can try to fit to this overall set of data that I have observed. And if uh, that fit works good, then I know that the material has several relaxation processes and uh, some of them could be related to side groups, some of them could be related to segmental motion and so on. So, I can try interpreting the viscoelastic response and the microstructure together to understand the viscoelasticity origins quite clearly. So, therefore, uh, the stress uh, decay as we have seen uh, with exponential function for a constant strain is uh, the response that a Maxwell model gives. And uh, just to highlight again that this is because uh, we are looking at only small strain response and uh, relaxation modulus is only a function of time. And for a nonlinear response, E will be a function of time as well as E naught. Remember, in all of this, stress is always a function of uh, strain, but the response variable is not a function of strain. There is no strain in the function. So, that is what is linear response, while in a nonlinear response, even the relaxation modulus itself will depend on the amount of strain because the material structure has changed due to the application of very large amount of strain. And again, as we discussed earlier in case of creep, uh, by multiple strain inputs, we can actually superimpose and obtain the overall strain inputs. So, with this, uh, we will uh, close this uh, lecture, where we have looked at uh, the response of Voigt and Maxwell models. And uh, we will see that for to describe rubber like uh, model materials, uh, we need a standard linear solid, which is the simplest possible model that can describe the rubber like response, because it has more solid like feature at uh, under uh, short time scales as well as large time scales. While Voigt model and Maxwell model are more suited for a only solid like sample or only liquid like sample. So, we will use standard linear solid, which is much more applicable for uh, rubber like samples. Uh, these are just few uh, textbook examples of models. Uh, over the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, we have uh, lots and lots of models which uh, can each capture the response of different uh, materials under differing conditions. Thank you.